everyone and welcome back to another FLP webinar as always. I'm Ariana, the host for our webinars and we have Austin Davis joining us again. If you were here for last year's webinar with Austin, you know the years of knowledge he brings as the owner and creator of the Virtual Tactical Academy since 2012, which is a pretty long time and personally has trained thousands with his realistic VR use of force simulator, which is one of the reasons why we're very excited to have him on tonight's topic over verbal commands and virtual training. Verbal commands, as Austin and I have talked before, is often a skill that some people forget about when training, which is why we have Austin discussing this knowledge to help serve as a tool to help you effectively diffuse any potentially dangerous situations because we don't want anything bad to happen, you guys. So we're here to bring you some knowledge, mainly Austin. I'm here to just introduce Austin for you in the topic. But already, as always, make sure to submit any questions you have in the comment section and we'll get to them during the Q&A session of the webinar. And this webinar is recorded, so you can always watch, share this at a later time if needed if you miss any portions of it. Thanks again, everyone joining this month's webinar. All righty, Austin, do you want to get us started on what the viewers are really here to listen to? Thank you for the introduction. Hello, my FLP family. I say family because I'm a member also. So is my wife. So is my son. So is my brother. And as a police officer, just please take it. That's if I trust them to come help them with the fight after the fight. That tells you where my heart's at. I am so glad you picked this topic because this is something near and dear to my heart. Now, I am an old trainer. I've been doing this for over 30 years. But about 12 years ago, I bought a very expensive simulator system and started taking it in that direction. The reason I did is because after all these years, I get these calls from my clients all the time going, Austin, Austin, I need a crime prevention class and I need to have a high level of defensive shooting class. And I'm going, those are both great ideas, but they very ever seldom come together. They're almost always separate topics. And what we need to understand about that is there's never really been a lot of latitude for self-defense shootings. And today there's essentially none. And the problem is, as it says on my business card on the back, is standing still and shooting a piece of paper in a well-lit, well-controlled environment is excellent training for standing still in a well-lit, well-controlled environment and shooting a piece of paper. It has very little to do with the very high cognitive loads. And, you know, even if you go to one of the fanciest shooting schools, they're going to say threat and you pull your gun and go. Well, I really doubt in a Walmart parking lot or Target parking lot, someone's going to yell threat. So we have to learn to interpret and visualize that. And basically, if you think about it, almost all of your defensive uses are going to break down into three steps. It's going to be vision, decision, and then action. Vision, decision, and action. Think about that for a second. If we just work on the gun part, we're just waiting until we get the part of the crime where the action is. If we have the vision, that situational awareness, and if you are a Concealed Coalition member and you are a member of my Concealed Coalition University, you should be. Um, we have a wonderful course on situational awareness. I also just wrote a book recently. I think you can find it on Google now. I feel like I've made it because it's on Google. Um, but situational awareness is the sooner we see that thing, the sooner we have the vision of the problem coming, the more time we have and time gives us options and decisions. When it comes to decisions, we always get all hung up. And I don't care how much you practice with your gun, if you have a sub-second draw stroke, the problem is, is you have to make a decision. And you only get four decisions. And most people don't even really think about this. But you get, I'm going to leave. I'm going to talk. I'm going to use force. I'm going to use deadly force. And when you start breaking it down that way, you have to determine when you can do those things before you can even begin to get to the action part of it all. So, what is the solution to this? You know we live in a world where the threats are getting, I'm not political here, but the threats are getting greater every day. The risk of something significant happening to you, your family, or something larger than just a normal crime are kind of picking on up. And so maybe we want to pick our skill sets up. So how do we do that? Again, you can go to a shooting school and you can learn to shoot faster, but if you have a one second draw stroke, and you have a 30 second decision process, that one draw stroke doesn't really help. And you never can shoot faster than you can process. So how do we do this? Well, first off, let's clear up a few terms here. What's the difference between instruction and training? Instruction is when we tell you something and you put it in your head and it goes in a part of your brain called declarative memory. So you watch a YouTube, you go to a concealed carry class, state mandated for your class, and you go through that. And that is learning and that's instruction. The problem is if it goes in your declarative part of your brain, the only way you can retrieve the information is you have to actively think about it. But if we train you, 
we have same stimulus, we get a different response after training. And that means that these things went from you having a primal approach where you sort of just kind of go ah, to a programmed approach. And how do we do that? Well, we use high fidelity, realistic training. Don't care how good your live shooting program is. It's difficult, if not impossible. Even simunition training is hard to do this because it's all about shooting each other with the with the, the Sims guns and about having the mask on where you can't really read the facial features. And so I'm a big fan of VR, high fidelity training. And one of the reasons I'm a big fan of high fidelity training is we can put your brain in a place that it perceives as very scary while we keep your body very safe. And this is very helpful in absorbing material in that sort of procedural memory that hopefully will pop out in a programmed way when the tension's high. Because any behavior not learned under stress cannot be recalled under stress. So the more high fidelity and I can put into you, the better off. And the other thing that we can do with VR that's difficult and not impossible to do with live fire is something called interleave and training. Now, the problem is most of the time when we train, and I know this because I've, I've been involved in police training, and so we do a lot of silo training. We have law here. We have defensive tactics here. We have code of current procedure here. Then we have patrol procedures, and we have shooting, but we don't tie them all together. If you think about it, we want to interleave those things. So if you go to a class or watch a YouTube or go to a seminar about law, under duress, under a high cognitive load, your brain will not be able to access that declarative memory, that thing you have to think about to draw that information from. So we have to find a way to put that down in you to where it just pops out in a natural flow without having to access it. And to do that is, is not the easiest thing in the world to do with a VR simulator, but it's almost impossible to do in live fire. Okay, so how does VR work? Basically, we put you in a situation to where you have to sort out a problem. I like to think of a well-run virtual reality um, use of force defensive session, kind of like one of those escape rooms where you go in. You know, yeah, you can go push the door open, but it's about solving the problem. And the great thing about using a simulator is I can put you in a situation and I can add just enough stress. Now, the real trick is, I cannot freak you out in the simulator because adults don't absorb material when they're freaked out. But just enough stress makes you receptive to what I call single event learning. Um, this may be a bad example. Okay, but let's say you throw up a liquor one time. You party too hard with like Jack Daniels. But in the rest of your life, somebody pours you a Jack Daniels. It's like, oh, no, not that. Or you, somebody left a cookie sheet when I was a kid on the stove and there was it was the the flame was still, I didn't know. I went to pick it up and it burned my hand. To this day, I see a cookie sheet and I think, mm, let's kind of poke it with a dish towel before we pick it up. Those are single event learnings. And it's very easy. Now, when I do a virtual reality class, I want you to be in a really safe place. And I don't want you to be alone with me at the simulator. I like running these things in large groups, 50 or 100 people. Now, in the four hours or six hours we have to train together, not all 100 people get to go through the machine. But what happens is I do sort of an empathetic learning cycle, which works really well with adults. I got some good research on this. What happens is when that person comes up, I talk to the crowd. I say, guys, guys, this is a concealed coalition event. That means we're all here to do the one thing we're all important, which is protect that which is important to us. Now, this person, you have to attach an emotion to. So this is your brother, your husband, your sister, your 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 cousin, your best friend, your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew. You have to, you have to put some emotion in them and you're pulling for them. They got to do well. And what happens is when you're the student, you can actually feel the people behind you pulling for you. And trust me, they're yelling out helpful things. You go, you got it, breathe, focus. What's important now? They're yelling out helpful things. Then when the scenario starts, you can kind of feel support behind them, but when the screen starts happening. What I really like about teaching um, judgment and use of force, personal protection advanced skills with a simulator, is at any point that I think you're going off the rails and doing something that's kind of primal, not programmed, I just pause the machine and I just go, Billy Ray, Becky, whatever your name is, I go, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you thinking right now? And so I say, tell me, and I go, Never even thought of that. You're doing great. Keep it going. Because see, there's a lot of ways to do something that still works and right. And that's your process that's working for you. And over the last 12 years, I've had thousands of people tell me thousands of things, which I would have never thought. And it wouldn't have been my first thought, but they work fine. It's not about the way. It's about you finding 
your way. And we have to go through that. But most of the time when I stop you and I go, Becky, Billy, Bubba, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you thinking? They tell me, and I go, hey, how about this? Have you thought about da, 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 da? And they go, no. And I go, okay, how about this? Would you like to run this through again? They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, cool. And I ask the crowd, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, go, Becky. They're cheering for you. They settle on down. We start the thing in, and you work your way on through it. The human mind under crisis really hates novelty because if you've never even seen the situation before, your brain's in there trying to grasp for some sort of sticky note on the wall of your head that says, wow, this is relevant. Wow, I've seen this before. And what's really interesting is there's a, I've got like a thousand of these scenarios, shoot, no shoot, de-escalation, pepper spray, use of force, no win situations, ATM robberies, you name it. I got them all there and I kind of know how to pick which one for the student and where they're going. But when you're in the middle of this, the minute it starts, after about four or five seconds, you really can't tell. Your brain can't tell there's a real and a carefully imagined event. And the way that works is you ever watch a film, either in a theater or chilling at home with Netflix, and your favorite actor is up there or your favorite actress, and they're on a cliffside or a high building walking, and you're like, oh, oh, don't fall. You know they're not going to fall, but your brain doesn't know that. Your hands start sweating. You kind of feel a little clammy. Oh, no. Well, that's exactly what happens in a simulator, except the only difference is I can go ahead and manipulate different factors in that. These are all shot and branching videos, so I can make him pull a badge. I can make him pull a gun. I can make him pull a coffee cup, and you have to work your way on through that. And as we work our way on through that, there's five core skills I like teaching in my basic virtual tactical academy course. So these five skills, again, are almost impossible to learn in live fire. The first one is do you have the will, the skill to use force? Now, one of the things I love is I've been doing this for years. I, 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 for two or three years, I had a fixed school in Houston, but I gave it up so that I could travel. I've probably trained in 40 out of the 50 states. I've trained thousands and thousands of people. And almost every class this will happen. If you come to mind, you will see this. It's usually one of the first people that comes through. There's going to be a situation where, okay, we've got to pull the fire and we have legal justification for doing that. We have a legal justification to, to, to point it at them. And man, they are coming at us with a knife. This is a, you need to shoot them. Or, and that student will turn to me and go, can I shoot him? And I always go, I don't know. You got the gun. Can you? See, when they ask me, can I shoot him? They're not really asking, can I shoot him? They're asking me a couple of questions. One, they're asking me, are you giving me permission to shoot them? You see, the problem I've got is after doing this for all these years, and I've kept sort of back of the envelope kind of statistics, but when I play this out, it works out about this. One out of five of my VTA students over the last 12 years, so if I have 10 people in there, that's two of them, 20%, cannot shoot the actor on screen without some help. And I want you to think about this. Most of the students who come into my class are, are defensive firearm owners. I'd say a large percentage of them, 80, 85%, either have a concealed carry permit or they're in a permitless state and they carry daily, but they've never actually thought, can I shoot somebody? And if you think about it, a lot of people go, oh, I could shoot them. Maybe, maybe not. What's really interesting is over the years, I've had people show up with beards and tattoos and the, the plaid shirt and they saunter up and they tell me I've killed more men than unfiltered cigarettes and unseat belted children. And then they get there, they freeze up and lock up. I've literally had a 90 year old woman on a walker scream, die mofo, die. <laughs> you just never know who's going to show up in the simulator. I think of it as sort of the performance polygraph, but we need to decide if you can shoot somebody. Now, sometimes I have to work people through this and I have to go, okay, let's think about this for a second. If you do not use and project force with the tool you have in your hand, this firearm, what do you think is going to happen? And I go, okay, he's going to stab me. Can you accept that? No, I can't. Let me tell you what, would you like to do it again and then see if you can shoot him? Yeah. And then a lot of times what happens is I get, and then we go ahead and play it back. And and the great thing about my my system is I can show you which shot went where and at what time frame it went in. And a lot of times those people will shoot and miss the whole person. And these are not marksmanship difficult problems. And then I have to go, okay, Becky, Billy, Bubba, how about this? Can we do it again this time? I need you to understand that we don't really, we aim the gun with our body, but we confirm with our sights and we want to make sure that every round we fire really does what it's supposed to do. Because if you decide you need to shoot somebody, you're deciding you need to shoot it right now. It's an imminent threat. And that means that time is on our friend and all those bullets you just shot that went through the wall or down the street, you're responsible for every one of those rounds. And 
not only are you spend those rounds, you're wasting time. You're increasing your risk of hurting an innocent person, and we're not stopping the threat. And you're going through. And what happens is after that, boom, 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 those groups tighten up because they start seeing the whole thing. Um, so can I shoot them? The next thing we have is some people have such poor mechanics. And again, when we shoot a firearm, we don't we don't aim with the sights. We aim with our body. We just confirm with our sights that our body's aligned it. I'm not saying we point shoot, but mechanically, the more things, your feet, your hips, your shoulders are, are consistent with aiming that tool, the more likely they are to hit. We just need the last second double check to make sure that our sights are on target and we've made a conscious decision to shoot. So this can I shoot thing, I've literally had people tell me I've been carrying a gun for years. and I finally realized in your course. I just don't even shoot somebody. As far as I'm concerned, the whole group loves them, supports them. They clap, they cheer, and I, I love them too. And hey, a gun's not your tool. That's great. I'm glad we found this out. We spent our time well with you. We're going to get you a pepper spray, a baseball bat wrapped up in barbed wire, or maybe a pair of matching pit bulls. But the first question we always get in use of force in the class is, can I shoot them? Next one is, may I shoot them? See, it's can I, may I, should I, and must I? So can I? I don't know. Do you have it on you emotionally? And do you have the physical skill set to do this? A lot of people who shoot really well at the range just lose it at the beginning of a simulator. I've got to really work their brain to calm them down to get those mechanics under control. So can I? May I? This is where it comes in the legal part. What's also interesting is, is, is you know, if you think about it, if you ever have to use force, you're going to be judged by a jury of your peers, which I always found that kind of interesting because your peers may not be ex-military, ex-law enforcement, gun owners, the kind of people that will give up a Thursday night to watch a webinar uh, with fire and legal protection to, to further their education to, to help them with the fight after the fight. But it's interesting because these are some real pro-gun people behind you in the crowd watching you, your fellow students who are waiting their turn to come on up here. And I ask them after that, they go, you know, was this a good shooting or a bad shooting? We hear, it was great. It was not great. They should have shot early. They should have shot late. First shot was good. Last shot was bad. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't even play one on the webinar. But the thing we want to always understand is we want to work this out because the problem is, is if you try to study a law book and figure out what's law, when that person's coming in with a bad or whatnot, you really can't figure it out. So I usually break it down to a very simple formula. A firearm's only useful. It's a very useful tool in a very narrow set of circumstances. And for me, and I hope I don't get in trouble for doing legal advice, here it is. To save human life, not harm innocent life, and the absolute tool of last resort. And, you know, if you think about it, there's no time to run through the penal code or code of criminal procedure or try to figure out which state you're in, which one has to work out. But if you remember, if you carry a deadly firearm or even use force of pepper spray, you know, before you use the firearm, ask yourself a question. Is this to save a human life? You're not shooting somebody trying to steal your TV or steal your catalytic converter. It's not going to harm innocent people. That means you didn't shoot the wrong person because you did not get enough mechanics of skill. Yes, there's a place for a live fire range. And make sure that you aim with your body, check with your sights, and don't press a trigger unless that sight is on exactly what you intend to shoot. Because if you miss and that person moves and it whizzes down the street and hits little Billy or little Janie, we're responsible for it. So can I? May I? Should I? Boy, there's a lot of situations where you could probably use deadly force and it's legal. But there's a concept called lawful but awful, which means, you know, you may get off on it criminally, but you may have civil liability. You may get off it criminally and civilly liable because you have FLP to help take care of you, but you become a social pariah. So we have to also look at, you know, can I... May I? Should I? And then we have to teach ourselves that there's a certain situation where it's go time. It's a must I. If you don't do something, they're going to hurt you or the people you're responsible for. You're at some food court in a mall and some guy 40 yards across opens up with a gun. That's pretty much a must I situation. And by going through the simulator, you can work through that. And it's in a place that you can make mistakes. We can stop it and back it up because the key to VR learning with adults is I don't care how many times we have to go through it. You have to win the scenario before you go back to your seat. I've got to have you success model in there. And I have to have you go through enough paths to try to figure this out so that when you get through at the end of that success model, you go, you know what? I had to work through some things, but if I was in another situation like that, I would, I, I think I have a grasp on it. I feel pretty comfortable. And since the people in the crowd are pulling for you because they're, they're cheering for you, you did great, you did great they're learning as well. And what's interesting is every time one of my students learns a lesson, I can't get anybody else in the crowd to make the same mistake. It's like they're learning by empathetic osmosis. It's really a beautiful thing.
So first thing you do in a VR class of, of mine, the, the, the five things are, is you get used to using force and just using force of the firearm specifically. I also have pepper spray that we can use in the VR world and, and it works as well. The second thing is verbal commands. Now, I've been a police officer commissioned in the state since 1996, okay? And I'm third generation police officer. You know, police officer generations have been using their voice to get people to do things they want. But the problem is if you had a live fire range, talking to a paper target doesn't really do it. You really need to have interactive chat. Well, with a VR simulator, my guess simulators again are shot and what's called branching video. We shoot the thing a different way. So I can make him say pound sand. I can make him throw his hands up and say, I give up. I can make him go face down. I can make him reach out for a gun and charge you. And so based on my 30 plus years of experience, if I think you're giving effective commands, I can go ahead and make him comply. If I think your commands are beta, not alpha um, commands, I can I can jack him on up. So I can use this tool in, in a nice interactive way to kind of subtly get your brain to sort of push and feel and find what works for you. Now, when it comes to verbal commands, we do this because we wanna set boundaries, goals, and penalties for you, the bad guy, and the witnesses. See, the problem is if you just pull a gun out and go bang, 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 you may need to do that if it's a situation you must shoot. But if we're shouting out commands beforehand, and remember when it comes to verbal commands, a lot of us lock up. I'm gonna try to make this kind of simple for you. Basically, verbal commands have three outcomes. You wanna freeze them, you wanna pin them, or you need to move them. Freeze them, pin them, move them. Um, freeze them means freeze, don't move. This means I am so far behind the curve here. I need you not to move a muscle. Do not make any furtive movements. I, I've got to catch up here. I'm, I'm mentally behind the curve. Pin them means I don't really care what you do with your hands, but don't get closer to my daughter. Don't come closer to me. Don't try to enter the house of worship. You don't really care what they're doing here, but you're trying to pin them. And these things need to be done in a manner of confidence. And what happens is, is, if you're not careful, giving verbal commands, having a gun in your hand is multitasking. And you may have gone to a class where you learn verbal commands. You may have gone to a class where you learn to shoot, but when you put a gun in your hand and you have to talk, this becomes multitasking. And without experience, it becomes overloaded. And what's really interesting is once you understand it's freeze them, pin them, remove them, and the level of volume has to be enough where they hear you, but you don't want to startle them, but you need to make sure they understand you're serious and you have to find that level and you have to play with it. And again, I can use the machine with the feedback of this person. They're like my little virtual marionette and work it on out because you will talk to more people than you'll point guns at. You will point guns and talk to people more than you will shoot them. And if you talk to people properly with a gun in your hand, you probably won't have to shoot them. So the verbal command component is something that's really underrated. And again, quick review. Freeze them, pin them, move them. And when it comes to verbal commands, there's another little key here. And you have to decide, do you want to use five steps to de-escalation? This is also my book on de-escalation. We have a great episode on Concealed Coast University about this. Um, go there and find out those five steps. But here's a very simple guideline about freeze, pin, and move. Ask, tell, make. Especially with somebody you're not real sure if they're a good guy, bad guy, or unknown. Ask, hey, man, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have your money. I don't have the, the spare change you need. You can't borrow my phone. Please back off. They don't. You ask them, then you tell them, hey, I really need you to back off. If you don't back off, we're going to have a problem. I had a rough childhood, and this is tripping me out. Or I had a bad day, or I think I got the <coughs> I got the COVID, and they got the mask. So whatever. And then if they don't, you may have to make them. Now, between ask, tell, and make, there's the magic question. Hey, dude. Is there anything I can say or do to get you to put the bat down or stop reaching in your waistband or whatever? If they say pound sand or they start coming at you, then you have to decide if you want to use ordinary force or you want to use deadly force or you want to pick your other options, which is um, the next thing, which is tactics. Now, when you talk about tactics, it's not mean growing a beard and getting a flannel shirt and a bunch of tattoos. That's not exactly it. Tactics to me are controlling three variables, time, distance, and safer angles. Time. Do you want to act now or do you need to wait your turn? A lot of times we don't want to just jump in and pull our gun and start shooting because we don't know if we're facing a lethal threat. A lot of this stuff comes down to an interview. They're going to come up and talk to you in an interview, decide if you're quick, easy, low risk, low, low chance of, of, of resistance. So sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes in the middle of a robbery, if you watch John Correa's channel, you'll see. Sometimes, you know, you, you jump up, you're going to get shot. Sometimes he turns around. That's your time. So time, act now, act later. Distance, do you want to get closer? Do you want to get farther? You know, sometimes after the shooting, I notice a lot of my students will run up to the bad guy. I am not exactly sure whether they're trying to close the gap while they have a distance tool, but it happens all the time.
So in some situations, you want to get farther away. Sometimes, though, you want to close that distance. Let's say you are in the Pulse nightclub and this guy is shooting and the gun jams or he reloads. At that point in time, if you're in a non-permissive environment, you don't have a gun. First rule of the gunfight, bring a gun. Because if you don't bring a gun, you're not in a gunfight. You're in a shooting, very different life experience. Rule number two of a gunfight is if it hurts, awkward, or uncomfortable to carry it, you will not have rule number one. So make sure it's comfortable. But you may need to close the gap in a situation if you're in a nightclub or an active shooter or he's reloading or, or having some sort of equipment malfunction, that's your time. You need to go now and close that distance. The third thing is safer angles. I want you to think about this for a second. A lot of times the reason you are in this, this use of force situation, this unjustified use of force by another person, whether it's either being projected, threatened, or planned, because remember crime happens and motive meets opportunity is because the criminal picks the target, the place, the time, and is a victim how do we know when a crime starts? He knows it starts because he started. How do we know? When motive meets opportunity and we become aware of it. And he picked that spot because it was most advantageous to him. It was least advantageous to you. Now, some people say, well, that, that angle stuff is getting off the X. Well, I kind of have a problem with that, that X, because you're the X. So you move. Look, I'm off the X. No, I'm still the X. Um, actually, it's learning how to use cover, concealment, and safer angles. And we have a great Conceal Coalition episode on this. When you come to Virtual Tactical Academy, I patented an item in 2016. Uh, I was in my office um, July of 2016 when the Dallas Police Department got shot up. I saw a very brave officer who was working on a big pillar in a building. He was very close to the cover and the uh, attacker got around him and, and, and fired him fired on him and took his life. And I went, we don't train enough about that. So I invented these gadgets, come to my class, you'll see them. I patented it. They're in use in law enforcement and military all over the, of the country. And it's, it's a spiffy gadget. We're the only ones who offer this thing. But learning to get behind something that will absorb the things that are trying to hurt you will make you a whole lot safer. So tactics are time, distance, and safer angles. So those are the three skills I want to teach in this that are before the attack. The left of bang, bang the event, left of bang. Okay, the things that that you know, vision, decision before the action. After the action goes off, though, there's two things we train in 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 uh, virtual tactical academy that are that are underrated, and that is your 911 phone call and dealing with the police officer. I don't know how you deal with this on a live range. I don't know how you deal with this in simulations, but I guarantee you, after you survive this incident on the virtual scenario, your brain went through a lot of changes. You're going to find out it got real quiet. A lot of you have auditory occlusion. You're going to find out you had limited vision. You're going to lose fine motor skills. Um, I've had people push the magazine release and just dump the magazine right out my Sim 17 guns. I have these really sort of like Glockish kind of polymer kind of training guns. They feel like regular gun. The magazine drops out, goes in, slide works. But afterwards, we have to talk about the most important phone call of your life. Now, I don't know if you're ever going to be involved in a lethal incident that you have to pull a gun or if you have to use a gun, but I do know this. If you're an incident, you're going to have to call 911. And this is probably the most important phone call of your life. And the problem is some of you have had instruction in it, but you've never had training in it. You see, when you call 911, you're making a statement to law enforcement. It's being recorded. You can't amend it or alter it. Your lawyer is not near you. You went through a very extreme experience, more than likely, which is almost like trying to make this call when you're intoxicated, and we never practice it in real time in a realistic high-fidelity environment, and we wonder why it goes so bad. So after each one of the scenarios, we run through the five steps to do 911 phone call. Now, something about the nine, uh, the five steps to 911 phone call that I go through is, what's the difference between an amateur and professional? Amateurs do a skill until they get it right. Professionals do it until they can't get it wrong. And after every one of our use of force incidents, we take every one of the VTA students with everyone watching and we go 911 state emergency. They have to talk their way through it. And everyone in the crowd's out there kind of helping them if they need it and then working through it. And you will find by the end of the day, that whole collection of students has this valuable skill down. Whether you come to my school, you do it yourself, you watch a good YouTube from a reputable defense lawyer you trust, have a plan. Your plan doesn't have to be my 911 plan, but just understand you mess this up. Even a pristine use of force can go horribly, horribly wrong. And I love me some dispatchers. I'm a police officer. I'm still on patrol, but I got news for you. Their job is to get more information for officer safety. Your job is only telling them as much as they need to know to come respond to you. 
Now, the final thing of these five core uh, skills that we like to work on, the discrete skill sets in the basic level of, of a reality trainer and virtual reality is how to deal with the police officer who shows up. See, the problem is we went through an experience and you may still have a gun in your hand. You may have a gun in your hand pointed at the bad guy and he comes in and says, drop the gun. And you don't hear him because you have auditory occlusion or because we've never trained for this, you turn and look and get shot. This is not unheard of. It may not be all that common, but it is not an uncommon occurrence. Um, more likely than possible, okay? So we wanna make sure that we understand there's some things we need to do. We make sure we have a greeting, which means when we greet them, we don't have a firearm in our hand. It's either squared away in our, on our person or locked away. Next thing is we have a very careful, specific system we take you on through to deal with the officer. But the fifth thing we teach you after you go through these other four steps is lawyer up and shut up. I don't have my car keys handy, but I've got my FLP tag in there. It's also um, dialed in my phone. And another little trick that you can do is inside your phone case, take a piece of paper. I don't want to show you the back. This got the numbers on it. Um, these are all the important numbers I need because if I'm ever in a situation where I pull this out and put it in my pocket and the police sees my phone, I can still use these numbers to call my FLP lawyer, my family, my chief of police, all the people that I need that are important to me. Um, this thing gets dropped, gets broken in a struggle for whatever reason, I still have these numbers. I come out of jail, they didn't turn off my phone, my phone's dead, I still have these numbers. So maybe I don't wanna use my phone for a reason and I wanna borrow somebody else's phone, I need these numbers. So you just write them down, print them out, cover them in some tape, put them inside the back of your phone case and then if you ever need, because I don't know about you, I'm so lazy and geeked out, I just punch in the number, but I don't have them memorized in my head. So in closing, we are in a situation where I think it'd be fair to say that we face a next level threat. I would be shocked if by the end of this year, we did not have some sort of large event attack. And I would not be shocked if the crime rate, which is already very high last year, has an extremely high rate this year. Um, just from my patrol and my own PD, I'm seeing the trends going higher. There's never been much margin for error in a defensive use. There's essentially none now for you as a good guy defender. So what I'd like to talk to you about is just raising your training, make it more realistic, more relevant, and make sure it's recent. Because if it's not realistic, it really won't work. And if it's not recent, the problem is, is in a time of crisis, you're not going to rise your level of expectations. You're going to fall back to your lowest level of recent training. So that training you did a year, two years ago, may be worn off and needs to be relevant. So, you know, if you want to go put plate carriers on and run around with your rifle, that's cool. That's great. But that's not probably going to be relevant to how you train. If your training relates to military tactics or law enforcement, that's very different. You know, as a police officer, my fight starts and ends very differently. I've got to go investigate this and stick myself in trouble. And that fight will end when I put handcuffs on or use a certain level of force. You as a civilian want to break contact and you want to get away and you don't want to be instigator in it. So the whole point of this is, is please come take some high fidelity training. The best way to do this is become a member of Conceal Close University and then watch each one of these skills I talked about. I've got a 45 minute or so class in this and it's broke down little pieces and it's got tests and you get a certificate for it. Do that at least 48 hours before you come to class and then watch those videos, take the test. And then when you come on through and get that from online, that's in your declarative memory. You got to think about it. That sort of built the shelves in the library. When you get there, I'm going to put books on that shelf down a procedural memory. I'm going to give you a little bit of stress in front of you, a little bit of fear, but the crowd's going to be loving on you and supporting you. So you're going to feel safe from behind, but a little, little tense in the front. And then let me just work with you and just increase your chaos cup. So that at first, when you're in those scenarios, that it's just really simple and it seems overwhelming. Before you know it, you're running through two or three or four scenarios in a row where, man, you're working at a high level, you're thinking. Because remember, when we shoot a live firearm, we do it in the lowest cognitive way. You can only aim one way. OK, you got a place to put the gun down. You know when to pull it out. If you go to fancy shooting school, they yell threat or up or gun or whatever. Your threat won't. You'll have to see it visually. So remember, it's vision, decision and action. So we have to work these things on out and we have to do it in a process oriented way. And I had a good time with you guys tonight. Let me tell you kind of how this works. If you ever want to have FLP or Concealed Coalition send me out to your church, your business, your civic group, your your gun club or whatever, 
call this lovely woman right here or contact us through any of the FLP directions. She'll give some sort of number or way to do this. And if you put a big enough group, we'll put me in my machine. My machine travels in a small Pelican case and I have a screen that comes in. It plugs in and again, I've got a thousand scenarios in there. And let me do my thing. It, it can take three or four hours, depending on how big your group is. The bigger the group, the better it is. In case you can't tell, I'm a foreign professional comedian. So I promise you it's stand-up comedy meets John Wick and uh, meets PlayStation or Xbox. And it's, it's something you've never seen. But I want you to be very careful. Not all VR sessions are the same. These are very powerful tools. You don't ever want to play on it like it's a zombie hunting game with the scenarios on it. And you want to make sure that your instructor who talks you through this has a real basis in real world events. Um, his training has been vetted by Street Proven, but most importantly, they respect that everyone comes in here with a certain amount of pre-existing triggers. And I don't know what you've been through. And I only want to make sure that I put you under enough stress that's so okay. So anytime you say, hey man, I need out today, I had enough, hey, we just put you on the side and it's all good. But I can put you in a place where you're loved and respected. And if you've never been to a Seal Coalition event, it's a place where you just you just feel a lot of love. And my final statement is like I say before, I leave every event. It's be a guardian always and a warrior when needed. That was great. Thank you so much, Austin, for providing another very informative webinar with us. Now we know how important it is to have virtual training and how important it can be for real world situations. And you're, you're just excellent at giving straight up information and it's always very engaging the way you do give the information. So thank you again for joining us for this month's webinar. And I really liked the back of the phone tip. I know some of the people were commenting on that. It's very simple, but I could see how extremely effective that can be just having your contacts in the back right there. Let me ask you a question. To think of your five best friends. If I asked you right now to write down their phone numbers on a piece of paper, how many of the five could you actually write down from memory right now? I actually have one, and it's because she made me remember her phone number oh, in me. middle school. Do you, do you remember the one. number? Do you only remember the number, or only you have one friend? I don't know one which one. friend. Only one friend that I remember. You only have one friend? friend? This is the saddest story I've heard of. I have other friends, but I don't oh, know their number. What are you saying? <laughs> I just have one friend, so I have the one number. Yeah, I, don't know. I just remember one number. <laughs> but if you needed somebody else, and do you have FLP's number? Yeah, yeah, I have FLP's you have it in number. Memory? I know my mom and dad's number, but that's like, well, it's like four numbers. Mm -hmm. But you know, <laughs> yeah. under stress, Still. under stress, I'm going to yeah. need that FLP number. Under and if they stress, take my I'll phone it. and they take my phone, they go, you can call your lawyer. If you can find a phone, I'm going to turn around and find somebody and go, can I borrow your phone? Yeah. And then I've got it. It's, it's right. one of those tips that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then if it's ever out of your phone, it's like, oh man. It's yeah. also kind of nice for a first responder because if I ever find you out running or whatever and you're down and I look back in the back of that case and I see that in there, I open it up, I've got everything. So when I go yeah. running or riding my bike, I just turn it upside down so you can see all the numbers on the contact through the mm -hmm. translucent part so they know how to, to get in it because they can't really get them. I guess they can stick it on my face. but Yeah, they just tattoo it on your forehead. Why not? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. How many likes do we have to get before I would get a, a FLP tattoo on my forehead? If we get a million likes... I will get an FLP tattoo on my forehead. Please do That's not. That's up to you. A million likes, then yeah, we're getting that tattoo. Right now going, drive the traffic. Drive the traffic. I'll get the needle gun. <laughs> Scott, I know Scott. The, 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 he would he would get a needle gun off YouTube and and, mm -hmm. and, and do it for me. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We've had that happen here, not at the office, but we've had tattoo jokes, running jokes of FLP logos. So if we're gonna make this happen, it better be <laughs> for the likes. <laughs> Um, Too get John Brand on my left hip. <laughs> yeah, John Brand would love that. <laughs> I'll have to talk to him about that tomorrow. He'll get a crack out of it. But, oh, that word, crack. <laughs> <laughs> see what I did there? No. <laughs> um, but if, if you guys are watching this webinar, then most likely you're continuing to learn on ways to protect yourself. If you ever have to defend yourself, Austin mentioned FLP. You know why we're here. The logo's behind me. We're getting tattoos on our forehead of the logo. Then if you have to defend yourself, what happens after that? Before we get to the Q&A of some of the pre-submitted questions and the questions that were submitted in the comment section, I'm going to discuss what I'm going to discuss, not discuss, but I'm going to discuss what FLP has to offer for you and how we can have your back if a situation ever does happen. Firearms Legal Protection offers several different memberships to whoever is interested in signing up for legal protection. These plans are divided into individual plans and a family plan, which some benefits in pricing vary state by state. 
For the purposes of this webinar, we will look at our most common plans and benefits that are available in most states. The individual basic plan includes protection in your state of residence. It also includes uncapped payment of attorney fees for defense of criminal and civil cases. Firearms Legal Protection Memberships also extend to all legal weapons, including non-lethal weapons. With the Individual Basic Plan, you also have Defense of Extreme Risk Protection Orders, also known as Red Flag Laws. All plans have access to the 24-7 Emergency Attorney Answered Hotline, so no matter a time an incident may occur, you can count on our hotline and an attorney will pick up for immediate attorney-client privileges. You also have access to the MyFLP mobile app, and one of our recently added benefits, expungement of criminal record on non-conviction incidents. Members of all plans also receive access to digital content and special discounts. The next step up is the individual premium plan. This plan has nationwide coverage and also includes all the benefits just mentioned and payment of bail bond premium, payment of expert witness and investigator fees if either are needed in your case. There is also coordination of counseling support, payment of lost wages if you are out of work during trial, and a list of other benefits. We also have the family premium plan to choose from. For those who want the same protection, also apply to their family. For just a little bit more, you get all the benefits that were just mentioned, apply to your spouse and all minor children. If you want more information over these benefits, then check out our Instagram or Facebook page for uploaded explained benefit videos. Remember, if you, friends, or family are not already protected by firearms legal protection, Please click the link below for a special discount we offer our webinar viewers. Now, let's get back to today's webinar. All right, we're back and we're here for the Q&A. If any of you guys have comments, questions, just submit in the description. We're going to go over some of the pre-submitted ones first. What will happen if I feel threatened by someone? You come up to my car, doesn't show a weapon, can I point my gun at the person and scare them off? And will I be arrested if he calls the police? You know, I want you to think about this. When you think about use of force, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so you're probably listening to the wrong guy. So comedian, cop, trainer, but maybe legal advice. But if you think about it, they're going to judge you on five things. I call it I.I. rap. Um, first off, were you innocent? You know, did you start this thing? Did you did you jack up his car? Did you hit him? Is he coming out because you just hit his kid because you were drinking and driving down the street and, and ran over his child? So, you know, are you innocent? Is, is the threat imminent? Did you say, look, if I don't do something, remember that, can I, may I, should I, must I, that, you know, I must, if I don't pull my gun and do something right now or use force, display force, I'm in risk of imminent death. That's imminence. So innocence, imminent, I, I rap, R is reasonable. Is my behavior reasonable? As good guy defenders, we don't have to be perfect. We have to be reasonable, but we have to be reasonable in two ways. This is something most people have a hard time wrapping their head around. I'd be reasonable in my perception of the threat. And I have to be reasonable in my response to that threat. Now, she's asking about specifics. Who knows? There's so many variables. No two use of force situations are alike. So they're going to say, were you innocent? Was it imminent? What happened right now? Was your response, perception of the response is, is, is reasonable and your response reasonable? Um, could you avoid it? And a lot of people are going, well, I have to stand my ground laws. I didn't have to leave my... Hey, man, juries love it when you avoid it. And you know what? The cleanest win you'll ever have is the one you can get away from. So there's any way to make it out of this thing without doing it? Great. And the last thing is proportional. Did she pull a gun when the guy pulled a finger? You know, did the guy pull a gun and uh, she decides to drive over 14 people uh, on the sidewalk to get away from the guy with the gun? Was that a proportional response? I don't know, but I think the grand jury and the district attorney will figure that stuff out. So as long as you remember that all these situations are dependent on II rap, innocence, imminence, reasonable, avoidable, and proportional. So hope that answers your question. But if not, just remember I I rap. <laughs> awful. Just awful. It's great. It's great. Maybe they'll remember mm -hmm. then. So watching me think I I rap. <laughs> Um, this one, you briefly went over it already, already, I'm pretty sure, but it's just going over the 911 call process. The, I have a very specific five things I train people on. Um, a lot of people say, don't say anything to the police. 911 state emergency. You got to say something, yeah. but remember what you're saying is a, is a official statement to law enforcement it's being recorded. You can't amend it or alter it. You don't have your lawyer present. You went through probably something very, very significant. So we need to practice that. And remember the difference between education and training. You know, education is where you learn stuff, but training is where same response, uh, 
the different response to the same stimulus. So we really need to come to a class and train on that. And if you haven't ever been to a seminar where you get to hear a FLP lawyer talk about this and answer it, they're going to be able to give you much better specific things. When you come to my class, I feel a little more comfortable because I'm explaining this in context than trying to give a broad answer here. But the thing you want to take away from what I'm telling you is you have to have a plan with 911. And one other thing, um, we did a webinar with my brother in law. And remember, even if you pull a gun and they run away, you need to call 911 because it's like when you were a kid, the first one to tell mom was the victim. Well, that's kind of the same thing here. So, get on it. If you don't know what to do before you call 911, get your key fob out, get the back of your phone out, get your speed dial out, call your 911 program attorney and get some advice. Because remember, this is the worst day of your life. It's just Thursday to them. <laughs> so, you know, they, they're not freaked out about this. They'll guide you through it. They've done this before. This is your first day. Don't play another person's game. Let them guide you through this. They know that other person's game. They've been there. So, yeah. Yeah. Well put. This one's a little bit off topic, but you'll be able to answer either way. Is it legal for me to have my South Carolina license to carry in Washington, D.C., or can I carry it in Washington, D.C.? Comic cop trainer, father to Justin. None <laughs> of those things qualify me to answer this question. But Justin, my son, hey, I know you're homesick with the COVID right now. Uh, my wife and my brother, if they have the same problem, we're going to call an FLP attorney and we're going to get an official advice. I think we can also get it in printed form so I can print this out to say that, hey, there was no miscommunications in this thing. This is exactly it. If I don't understand what they printed out, I can call them and talk to them and say, hey, what is the difference between may and shall or must and all sorts of have them guide on through? You know, I like my FLP for the fight after the fight, but I like it for the fact that I've got a lawyer to keep me out of trouble. And remember, I, 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 I trust, you know, my son, Justin, my wife, my brother who are members, but here's the deal. Let's not make the lawyer's job any harder. When we take this thing to a jury trial. We know what's going to happen. So if you have questions like this, you have to use the app. You have yeah. to contact them and get the information. And then don't just look at it once. Really put it in that procedural memory. Get it locked in. Remember, there's one thing about learning it. There's nothing about anchoring it. So I need you to put that in there. And then maybe even keep that in your car or your airplane travel, wherever you're going, to, to remind yourself of what's going on if you have to show it to somebody to kind of explain to them that maybe you know the law better than the officer. Remember, they only went to you know X amount of weeks of police academy, but our lawyers have not only gone to law school, they the FLP lawyers have, you know, like many years of trial experience. So I would trust their opinion even more than the officers trying to jack me up and I love me some cops. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And like you're saying, if you're an FLP member, just check out the My FLP app. It will help you greatly with questions similar to this and contact our customer service team. They'll direct you to our attorneys at contact information. So then you can answer side questions like this as well. That's not for an incident. What was the woman's name who asked that question? Um, I would have to look it back up. Um, I, I would tell you that if you follow my advice and you're in my county that I'm patrolling on and I gave you bad advice, just use my name and it will help you when you're handcuffed in the back of the police car going to the jail. Give something to talk about and avoid that awkward silence we hate on the way to jail when you're in the back part of a car. There you go. <laughs> Bottom line, don't use me for legal advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My own legal advice is I can't fix stupid, but I can handcuff it. <laughs> All right. Can I be in my car with a firearm or pistol on postal office parking lot? And that's an FLP app question right there. Absolutely. And this is a really good question because there's recently been a court case yeah. and some people say, oh, that's all water under the bridge. Some people say it's still a problem. I need an experienced criminal defense attorney to give me the what up on that because that's a federal wrap. This is a serious deal. This is a wonderful question, but I'm not your guy to answer it, but the FLP app. But I like the way you're thinking because you didn't say go in. You said even the parking lot, which if you think about it, this is an adjoining thing. And, and there's some there's some nuances in that. This is a well thought out question. Whoever did it gets two thumbs up from Lieutenant Davis. Yep. <laughs> All right. Next question. It's a little bit more back on topic. In a self-defense situation, how vital is it to be verbalized, to have verbalized certain defensive words during a conflict? And what specific words should a self-defender verbalize during the conflict? 
Man, y'all are, y'all are firing all cylinders tonight. These are great questions. Before I say what specific words a self-defender should verbalize during a conflict, let's talk about what they shouldn't use, okay? I'm not a big fan of profanity. Now, this does not mean that that occasionally a, a certain bad word does not pop out under stress and police work or in my real life, but the problem is we have to think that everything we do these days is recorded on a ring doorbell camera or someone's phone. And remember the I, I rap, innocent, avoidable, excuse me, uh, innocent, imminent, reasonable, avoidable, proportional, the innocent part. I really think that if you use a lot of profanity and throw a lot of words out there that are inflammatory, I really do think you run the risk at some point of losing your innocent status, your victim status, that you look almost like a mutual combatant. And also when you're screaming, you dirty so-and-so, I'm going to shoot you in the do 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 this is not helpful. We're already in a place where we've lost prefrontal cortex. We've kind of gone into our lizard brain. And so we need to have simple direct communications. John Farnham taught many years ago to class I was at to have pre-done verbal loops. One of mine went out in public is, hey, sorry, I can't help you. And I stick my hand out over my heart. Sorry, I can't help you. And that's just sort of my response. So you, you want to have these verbal loops that play in your head. Remember back when it comes to, to verbal commands, we want to have a couple things in our head. We want to freeze them, pin them, or move them. So, you know, if you say freeze, don't move, and they pop out in front of you to freak out. And if you're an innocent and somebody tells freeze, go, sorry, man, what did I do? What did I do? If I'm innocent, I'm going to freeze for a second. But if they start digging for the waistband or whatever, you know, if you say, you know, don't get close to me, they go, hey, you know, what, why are you bothered? What are you worried about? Come closer. I'm disregarding your non-negotiable no, you know. And then before you go to make, ask, tell, make, remember, go, is there anything I can say or do to end this without any kind of violence? And they say pound sand. Well, then you have to do something and then you have to figure that on out. So, there is, there is pre-done loops that you can do, but remember one thing that about the loops is don't keep looping it. How many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? How many times do I have to tell you? Drift the knife, drift the knife, drift the knife. If it doesn't work two or three times, try a different verbal tactic on this thing. I see this a lot in my baby officers. I'm a field training officer. I make little baby officers, big officers, so that little baby officers grow up to be old officers. And remember, people always go, you're an old cop. Be very wary of old cops and profession that kills young cops. So yeah. Mm -hmm. But seriously, if what you're saying is repeated and be careful. Also, when it comes to verbal commands, watch your tone. There's sometimes that you can instigate a problem because you just got too intense with them. You know, decide when you need to communicate and when it needs to be more directive, when it needs to be kind of supportive and, and kind of coordinated effort and when it needs to be a direct, clear alpha base command. Awesome. All right. Am I expected to always use deadly force with my firearm? If so, why? I don't know who sent that one in. If they were here, I'd hug them. Okay. I got a problem. Here's my problem. I've been a certified police pepper spray instructor um, since the early 90s. I've made a lot of grown men cry in my life. The problem is a lot of people go, I don't need no pepper spray because I got me a gun. No one needs pepper spray more. No one needs to carry pepper spray more than somebody who carries a gun. So am I expect to always use deadly force in my firearm? If so, why? Yeah, you shot a human being. You put meat into a metal into meat. This is a definition of a deadly weapon. So what I may be reading in this, I may be reading it wrong. And if so, I'm sorry. Remember, if you're here, I'd hug you again. Make sure it's all okay. It's all huggy feely between us. Is I'm really concerned when people don't have something between profanity and a pistol. That's why I'm a big fan of pepper spray. Because remember, we can, in 80% of the situations you're going to have in a self defense situation, it's ordinary force, not deadly force. So I can only use proportional force. So if they're not projecting deadly force, I can't use deadly force. And all of a sudden, you know, if all you have is a nail, all your problems look like, all you have is a, a, a hammer, all your problems look like a nail. So that's why I'd like you have intermediate use of force. If you watched me on patrol yesterday, I've got my external vest, I got my pepper spray, I've got a taser seven, I've got an ass baton, I've got all kinds of stuff in my bat belt to deal with things between profanity and a pistol. As a civilian, have that. I'm a huge fan of having a crazy bright handheld light on you. This solves a whole Whole lot of problems. All dark holes in my world have threats to clear them. You're in the park, about blip, blip. All of a sudden, they've got that right in their face. Back it off, bring it back down their chest. Then they got that big purple ball rope stem. That's your body trying, your, your retina trying to put vitamin A back in it. Now they can't see because you got that big, you ever, you ever had a big flash go off, you got that big purple ball? Mm -hmm. That's how you start a party in low light. So, am I expect to always use deadly force in my firearm? So, yeah, if you're shooting them, that's deadly force. But if you have to use force and you don't have anything between profanity and a pistol, you're using deadly force in a place that it's not justified. And so that's what makes me nervous. So have another option because remember, there's, there's force and there's deadly force. There's ordinary force and there's deadly force. Have that tool there. And a pepper spray and a strong flashlight, 
went to, I, I travel all over the planet. I, I usually take about a month off every year and go travel with my wife. And, you know, I go all over the world and I take a, a, a small keychain pepper spray and a flashlight where the keychain pepper spray is legal. I take a palm pepper spray. It's very small in form factor and does a big job. So $12 for a box, of, a bottle of palm and can of palm pepper keychain. And you should be helpful. Great question. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, a couple more questions from pre submitted. We'll go through the comments, but I don't think there were that many in the comments. So if anybody else has any more questions, make sure to throw it in there. Next one, should verbal warnings differ if you're a woman? Man, there are three topics I hate talking about, politics, religion, and sexuality. So uh, this is a tough one for me. Um, this is a good question, and it's not a simple question um, because I work <laughs> – I, I, I'm on, I was on patrol yesterday with a woman who could teach me a thing or two about using her voice to control the situation. Guaranteed. I don't know that women specifically need different verbal warnings. Um, I do know this, that sometimes because of size of people, they need to use more volume than they think to get their message across. Because mm -hmm. remember, we're doing this to establish boundaries, penalties, and goals for me, the bad guy, and the witnesses. So a lot of times when I'm saying back up, I need to say it loud enough so that not only does my bad guy hear it, all my witnesses hear it. When I say, hey, I told you to back up, we want to say that a little louder to communicate to myself that, hey, this is getting serious. I told him, you know, I asked him, now I'm telling them, and then I'm going to have to make them, but they don't get it. So I have to raise this on up. So I'm not so sure it has as much to do with gender. It's just size. And just if you're naturally a soft volume person, I also find that a lot of people, when they start giving commands in the simulator, it's really low. It almost like you need somebody to train you in a simulator to give you permission to really bark that order out. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes you need to, to project that thing. I call it throwing a verbal rock. You know, if you're, this is a gross example, so kind of hang with me here. But if your dog's getting ready to drink out the toilet, you don't go, oh, Fluffy, don't go drinking out. It's like, Fluffy, stop. Back. Get away. Get away. You kiss your mother with that mouth. Get that out. <laughs> so that's that that's that verbal rock that's projecting. That sort of, you almost get a concussive effect of what's doing that. Now, if you start off with someone who walks up to you and like, hey, can I buy a dollar? You know, get back. Stop. Don't drink out the toilet. Okay, bad example. Mixed them up. But, um, but that might set them off and go, hey, what are you all jumping about? So, you know, you got to kind of read the situation. And remember, this is a dance. This isn't a solo performance. So, you know, it's stimulus response and it's a feedback loop and you have to kind of read it. And that's why I love a simulator. If you come off too hard, I go, hey, man, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you thinking? You know, was that appropriate? You like try it again. Let's try it again. And with my simulator, I can, I can s simulate whatever response I want because it's filmed with live actors and branching video. It's very cool. Definitely. All right. And um, how do you get out of a situation without any weapons? Oh, oh, they are firing. I'm telling you, my FLP fam is firing on all cylinders. There are things in this world called non-permissive environments, which means I can't take a weapon in there. Um, courthouse. Uh, I had to go to courthouse the other day. It's like I get to walk in with my bat utility belt, my vest, everything else, looking at everybody out there. And they're taking nail clippers out of them and the whole bit. The, the less tools you have to protect yourself, whether that is you're a BJJ expert or your golden gloves boxer, or you have a pepper spray, or you have a baton, or you have a firearm or an assault rifle or a shotgun, the more you have to be focused on keeping things left of bang, okay? Bang is the event. We want to keep it as far left as we can. That means you need to be much more situation aware. The problem is, and if you need situation awareness, I wrote a, a book that's been well received. We also have a great episode of Concealed Coalition University with it that takes you through it. Is situation awareness is not about sitting with your back to the wall at the restaurant looking around and and no, no. Situation awareness is going, look, 99.9% .9 of the time in my world, everything's all cool and calm and copacetic. I'm looking for it with a baseline of behavior. I'm looking for those things that are above it or below it. If you're walking in that courtroom and after you get in there, all of a sudden you hear that sort of noise and hum of people. Mur, 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 mur. All of a sudden it turns off. That's below the baseline. That's a that's an aberration below the baseline. It's an anomaly below the baseline. All of a sudden you're in a coffee shop and all of a sudden someone starts jumping up and dancing on the table. That's an anomaly. But if we're at a rock concert or a rave, someone jumps to the table, that's normal. Someone's sitting down drinking coffee or eating a book in a rave, that's below the baseline. So you have to learn to read that. The quicker you can spot the, the abnormal behavior, the things that are above or below the baseline, the anomalies, 
the more time you have to respond and the more time you have to respond, the more options you have. So you really want to develop a situational awareness. Also, if you go to my book or you can even Google it, uh, Colonel Cooper's color code, you want to be at least condition uh, yellow. But the real problem is, is how do you get situational weapons is don't be dialed into your phone when you're out in public because you're not going to see it coming. And if you can't see it coming, you can't prevent it. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Is it better to work on defensive pistol skill training before working on de-escalation training? This is a great question as well. Remember, it's 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 vision, decision, action. Um, if you think about it, the de-escalation part is really before the gun part. And if you are experienced with de-escalation, you'll know there are there are certain techniques. I, I teach a five-step process to, to de-escalate, but it's not necessarily to de-escalate, but it's to know when you can and cannot de-escalate a situation. The problem is a lot of times, um, and the problem with a lot of things in, in self-defense is if you overreact, you're in legal trouble. If you underreact, you're in physical trouble. So there's that fine line and where that is, it, it can move a lot in the, in the, in the, 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 the use of force incident. So um, I would work on de-escalation first, um, but remember, you cannot work on, remember we talked about silo and interleaving skills. You cannot work on de-escalation over here, then work on your gun skills here and expect them to work in real life. They won't do that. We have to do what's called interleaving training, where learn your de-escalation, learn your gun skills, then let's put it in a high fidelity environment. In my case, I love my simulator. I love my BTA. And, and then let's work on putting those two together because any behavior is called head law. If it's not uh, wired together, we'll fire together. And if it's wired apart, it will fire apart. And remember, if you learn de-escalation, um, it's just a series of, of, of YouTubes or the, the problem is, is it's not going to tie into those behavioral processes, which actually get you through it. And it's a skill and it's a skill you have to perform. It would be like trying to learn to read a ride a bike out of a book. You, you can get the basics out of write a book, but at some point we got to get the training wheels on you and push you and teach you to pedal and balance. And before you know it, you're whizzing around. And I love using that in the simulator because I can adjust the response of my my person on the screen and you won't even know that I'm adjusting it because it's like, man, he's not listening to me or, okay, I think I'm getting this commission. And I, if they start messing up, I can jack it up again. So the de-escalation skills, there's two core skills I think are undervalued. And I think they're discrete skills that need to be mastered. Now there's a thing called Pareto's principle, 80, 20 rule. You will get 80% of your results uh, from 20% of your efforts. Or, and so you don't need to be a master at it, but even just a, watching, reading my book, watching a skill coaching university and coming to VTA, you will be amazed. You're going to think it's like a superpower. These are not the droids you want. Keep going. Um, it, it, it really can be like a magic deal. But remember, de-escalation is not something we do to somebody. It's somebody we offer to them. It's like offering a pizza. Mmm, want a pizza? Hot, fresh, and delicious. They say pound sand. They go, oh, I'm kind of hungry. I'd like a pizza. So de-escalation is not something you do to them. And remember, what is the number one rule of de-escalation? This is the most important thing in my book. It's I wrote a whole chapter on this. Number one rule of de-escalation don't escalate the situation. <laughs> Remember, the only thing you can control in this world is yourself. So don't escalate the situation. Yep. All right. I think we have one more question and then we'll close it out. And this is someone from Facebook. Do you suggest that I help others that are in harm's way or just focus on my own safety? Oh, Clayton, man, you saved the best for last, brother. Mm -hmm. And wrap you up in a big old hug for that one. That's a good one. When you come to my class, one of the things we're going to talk about is you're going to hold up five fingers. You may need to hold up 10 fingers. These are the five people that I will go to the Texas prison system for. Number one, my son, Justin. Love you, bro. My wife, my mother, my brother, my niece. I don't have to know anything about the situation. If someone's threatening them, I can project as much force I need to make them safe. I screw things up. I go to the Texas prison system. They're okay. I'm going to be the happiest guy in the Texas prison system. I'm saying this at that time to be a former cop. You need to decide. What the problem is, is when you get involved in a third person incident, I need you to understand what are you really protecting here? So if you decide to go protect an innocent person and this thing goes south, and remember, there are no clean defensive use of force. It's not, it's never 100%, no matter how much you try. There's always something that's gonna go wonkers because it's a dynamic, rapidly changing event. You know, if you're in the Texas prison system and you can't bring and support your family, they may lose their house. The kids may have to go to a different school because you're social pariah now because of this stuff. The person that you thought was being 
beat up by their abusive spouse, they're going to come back and be on the news the next day going, it was a, it was a, a, a love tryst gone weird. We were going to get married. I don't care how many times he beat me before. This was, this was the day he had found the divine and was turning his life around when, when Clayton shot him and separated him from me forever. So it's something you really have to think about. The real problem with that question though is where I might use deadly force in a place where others might be. This is where a good pepper spray comes in because a lot of times that use of force you're jumping in with a gun on is ordinary force. One's beating another with a with a uh, uh, open fist, shaking them, whatever. This may not rise to the level of deadly force, but it's definitely rising to the level of you know let's let's get let's let's get the canned heat out and let's get at work. And the great thing about pepper spray is if you make a mistake, it's the only tool I'm aware of that you can just throw your hands up and go, my bad, <laughs> give it 45 minutes, it's going to be okay. Uh, so uh, except for one exceptional event, I'm not aware of any deaths by a quality oleoresin capsicum, unless, of course, you spray them in hog time and turn them face down in a pair of handcuffs, but, you know, we don't do that, so. All right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions. If there are any that I missed, you can always just email us at marketing at farmslegal.com. We'll make sure to get them answered. Austin, are there any other closeout words you want to say before I close it out? No, just tell them where they can contact you if they decide that, hey, man, I've got a group of 50 people and we want to have a virtual tactical academy. I'll come out there. I'll set my simulator up. We'll have a good time. I can do it in as little as three hours, but if I get four hours, that's even better. Uh, 50, 75 people is my sweet spot. And uh, I'd love to come to your house of worship, your business, your gun club or whatever. And trust me, um, you'll have a great time. You, It's like going to a comedy show with an Xbox and learning to be John Wick. Uh, it's 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 just a really cool thing. I've been doing it for 12 years and I would love to come to your facility, but I only come by invitation. So fill my calendar up. Put me on an airplane. I bet FLP will pay the ticket. <laughs> yes, definitely. If I get the tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or John Brand for $2 million. Mm -hmm. sure yep. Yep. <laughs> That's You'll right. Let him know. I, that'd be great. I'd mm -hmm. love to see you guys. Yep. And then um, I see, Robert, you were saying that there were some questions that weren't answered. There might have been, might have not been, but just email us. I promise we'll get them answered. But I don't see any in the comments that weren't unanswered. But Thank you again, Austin, for joining another webinar with us to share variable, very valuable knowledge. I'm combining words here <laughs> with our viewers. Thank you all very much. Remember, we're coming into 2024. Life is going to change for us in a lot of ways. I'm saying this as a police officer. I'm saying this as a guy who right now is going through active shooter training for law enforcement as an instructor programs. And uh, I just see a lot of bumpy things on the horizon. So love the people you need to love about, stay prepared, stay focused, stay vigilant, stay armed. And remember it, when the gunshot stops, that's when our next level of problem starts. So think about having something in place for the fight after the fight. And you kind of know where I lie on that one. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and if any of you guys want to purchase Austin's books, just email us at marketing. I've said this a couple times now, marketing at farmslegal.com. And I'll also have the books in the description below on Facebook and YouTube. But thank you all for joining this month's webinar. Remember to click all the links in the caption below to sign up if you want to get protected at a discounted rate. If you're not already, I know most of you guys are that usually watch our webinars, but also to let us know what you want to see in future webinars. We always appreciate hearing from you all. And if you enjoy content like this, make sure to like our Facebook page and hit that subscribe button and that little bell on YouTube just to make sure you receive any notifications in the future for whenever we do go live for webinars like this. And thanks again for everyone joining. As always, have a great rest of your night. And remember, protect yourself. We'll protect you. Good night.